been kind of interesting today. My um, abs, for some reason, are spasming. The muscles are. And I, I guess I'm not too worried about it because, I mean, muscle spasms happen. But, I mean, it's working my ab muscles, right? Anyway, what you guys came for was Jim Butcher's Turncoat. Book 11 of the Dresden Files. We happen to be today on chapter 47. So if you guys would like, share, subscribe, and grab your copies of the book. We left off when they were on the boat. and Or no, they had gotten off the boat. And Vincent, the other detective that Dresden had hired, just gave Dresden some pictures about um, surveillance that Dresden had him do and is now going to go ahead and show what that is because they have to go to the execution for Morgan and witness it because the White Council has actually asked them to. So anyway, let's go ahead. Hopefully you guys have had time to go ahead and grab your book and read along. Let's jump in here to chapter 47. Morgan's trial was held the next day. But since Scotland was six hours ahead of Chicago, I wound up getting about three hours worth of sleep, sitting up in a chair. My head and face hurt too much when I lay all the way down. When I got back to the apartment with Molly, Lucia was gone. I had been pretty sure she would be. I got up the next morning and took stock of myself in the mirror. What wasn't under a white bandage was mostly bruised. That was probably the concussion grenade. I was lucky. If I'd been standing where Laura had been when Binder's grenade went off, the overpressure would have probably have killed me. I was also lucky that we'd been outdoors, where there was nothing to contain and focus the blast. I didn't feel lucky, but I was. It could have been a fragmentation grenade, spitting out a lethal cloud of shrapnel, though at least my duster would probably have offered me some protection from that. Against the blast wave of an explosion, it didn't do jack. Having gained something like respect for Binder's know-how, when it came to mayhem, I realized that Kiet may have been thinking exactly that when he picked his gear for the evening. I couldn't shower without getting my stitches wet. So after changing my bandages, I took a bird bath in the sink. I wore a button-up shirt, since I would probably compress my brain if I tried to pull on a tee. I also grabbed my formal black council robe with its blue stole and my warden's cape. I did my best to put my hair in order, though only about a third of it was showing. And I shaved. Wow, Molly said as I emerged. You're taking this pretty seriously. She was sitting in a chair near the fireplace, running her fingers lightly down Mr.'s spine. She was one of the few people he deemed worthy to properly appreciate him in a tactile sense. Molly wore her brown apprentice's robe, and if her hair was bright blue, at least she had pulled it back in a no-nonsense style. She never wore a lot of makeup these days, but today she was wearing none at all. She had made the very wise realization that the less attention she attracted from the council, the better off she would be. Yep. Cab here yet? She shook her head and rose, displacing Mr. He accepted the situation despite the indignity. Come on, Mouse, she said. We'll give you a chance to go out before we head. The big dog happily followed her out the door. I got on the phone and called Thomas's apartment. There was no answer. I tried Laura's number, and Justine answered on the first ring. Mrs. Wraith's phone. This is Harry Dresden, I said. Hello, Dresden. Justine replied, her tone businesslike and formal. She wasn't alone. How may I help you today? Now that the fur of the manhunt had been blown over, my phone was probably safe to talk on. But only probably... I emulated Justine's vocal mannerisms. I'm calling to inquire after the condition of Thomas. 
He's here, Justine said. He's resting comfortably now. I'd seen what terrible shape Thomas was in. If he was resting comfortably, it was because he had fed deeply and intently with instinctive obsession. In all probability, my brother had killed someone. I hope he'll recover quickly, I said. His caretaker, that would be Justine, is concerned about complicating arising from his original condition. It was quiet for a moment. How bad is it? A business-like meter of her voice changed, filling with raw anxiety. He's under sedation. There was no choice. My knuckles creaked as they tightened on the earpiece of the phone. I left nothing behind. You don't have words for the things I did to him. I'd like to visit, if that can be arranged. She recovered, shifting back into personal assistant mode. I'll consult Miss Wraith, Justine said. I may not be practical for several days, though. I see. Could you let me know as soon as possible, please? Of course. My number is... We have that information, Mr. Dresden. I'll be in touch soon. I thanked her and hung up. I bowed my head and found myself shaking with anger. If that thing had done my brother as much harm as it sounded like, I was going to find the Nagloshi and rip him to gerbil-sized pieces if I had to blow up every cave in New Mexico to do it. Molly appeared in the doorway. Harry? Cab's here. Okay, I said. Let's go spoil someone's day. I tried not to think too hard about the fact that Wiley e. Coyote, super genius, pretty near always took a hideous beating at the hands of his foes, and finished the day by plunging off a two-mile high cliff. Well then, Harry, I thought to myself, you'll just have to remember not to repeat Wiley's mistake. If he would just keep going after he runs off the cliff, rather than looking down at his feet, everything would be fine. They held the trial in Edinburgh. There wasn't much choice in that, given the recent threats to the senior council and the uninspected intensity of the attack at Demon Reach. They wanted the most secure environment they could get. The trial was supposed to be held in closed session, according to the traditions of how such things were done. But this one was too big. Better than 500 wizards, a sizable minority of the whole council would be there. Most of them would be allies of Lafortier and their supporters, who were more than eager to see justice done, which is much prettier thing to do than take bloodthirsty vengeance. Molly, Mouse, and I took the way. Just as I had before, this time, when I reached the door, there was a double-sized complement of wardens on duty, led by the big Scandinavian, all of them from the old guard. I got a communal, hostile glare from them as I approached, with only a desultory effort to disguise it as indifference. I ignored it. I was used to it. We went into the complex, past the guard stations. They were all fully manned as well and walked toward the speaking room. Maybe it said something about the mindset of wizards in general, that the place was called the speaking room. It was an auditorium, though. Rows of stone benches rising in a full circle around a fairly small, circular stone stage, rather like the old Greek theaters. But before we got to the speaking room, I turned off down a side passage. With difficulty, I got the wardens on guard to allow me, Mouse, and Molly into the ostentuary while one of them went to Ebenezer's room and asked him if he would see me. Molly had never been into the enormous room before and stared around it with unabashed curiosity. This place is amazing, she said. Is the food for the bigwigs only? Or do you think they'd mind if I ate something? Ancient Mai doesn't weigh much more than a bird, I said. 
Lafortier is dead, and they haven't replaced him yet. I figure there's extra. She frowned. But is it supposed to be only for them? I shrugged. You're hungry. It's food. What do you think? I think I don't want to make anyone angry at me. Angrier. The kid has better sense than I do in some matters. Ebenezer sent the warden back to bring me up to his room at once, and he'd already told the man to make sure Molly was fed from the buffet table. I tried not to smile at that. Ebenezer was of the opinion that Prentices were always hungry. Can you imagine who had ever given him that impression? I looked around his receiving room, which was lined with bookshelves filled to groaning. Ebenezer was an aesthetic reader. King, Highland, and Clancy were piled up on the same shelves as Hawking and Nietzsche. Multiple variants of the great religious texts of the world were shamelessly mixed with the writings of Julius Caesar and D. H. Lawrence. Hundreds of books were handmade and handwritten, including illuminated gemores. Any museum worth the name would readily steal, given the chance. Books were crammed in both vertically and horizontally, and though the spines were mostly out, it seemed clear to me that it would take the practice of Job to find anything unless one remembered where it had most recently been placed. Only one shelf looked neat. It was a row of plain, leather-bound journals, all obviously of the same general design, but made with subtly different leathers and subtly different dyes that had aged independently of one another into different textures and shades. The books got older and more cracked and weathered rapidly as they moved from right to left. The leftmost pair looked like they might be in danger of falling to dust. The rightmost journal looked new and was sitting open. A pen held the pages down, maybe thirty pages in, and glanced at the last visible page where Ebenezer's writing flowed in a strong, blocky style. Seems clear that he had no idea of the island's original purpose. I sometimes can't help but think that there is such a thing as fate, or at least a higher power of some sort, attempting to arrange events in our favor despite everything we, in our ignorance, do to thwart it. The Merlin has deemed that we put the boy under surveillance at once. I think he's a damn fool. Rashid says that warning him about the island would be pointless. He's a good judge of people. But I'm not so sure he's right this time. The boy's got a solid head on his shoulders, generally. And of all the wizards I know, he's among the three or four I'd be willing to see take up that particular mantle. I trust his judgment. But then again, I trusted Maggie's, too. Ebenezer's voice interrupted my reading. Hoss, he said, how's your head? Full of questions, I replied. I closed the journal and offered him the pen. My old mentor's smiley only, smile only touched his eyes as he took the pen from me. He intended me to see what he'd written. My journal, he said. Well, the last three are. The ones before that were from my master. Master, huh? Didn't used to be a dirty word, Hoss. It meant teacher, guide, protector, professional expert, as well as the negative things. But it's the nature of folks to remember the bad things and forget the good, I suppose. He tapped the three books previous to his own, my master's writings. He tapped the next four, his master's writings, and so on, back to there. He, <coughs> he touched the first two books very gently, can't hardly read them no more even if you make it through the language. Who wrote those two? Merlin, Ebenezer said simply. He reached past me to put his own journal back up in place. One of these days, Hoss, 
I think I'll need to, you to take care of these for me. I looked from the old man to the books, the journals and personal thoughts of master wizards for more than a thousand years. Ye gods and little fishes. That would be one hell of a read. Maybe, Ebenezer said. You'd have a thought or two of your own some day, and you'd want to write it down. Always the optimist, sir. He smiled briefly. Well, what brings you here before you head to the trial? I passed him the manila envelope Vince had given me. He frowned at me, then started looking through pictures. His frown deepened, until he got to the very last picture. He stopped breathing, and I was sure that he understood the implication. Ebenezer's brain doesn't let much grass grow under its lobes. Stars and stones, Hoss, Ebenezer said quietly. Thought ahead this time, didn't you? Even a broken clock get it, gets it right occasionally, I said. He put the papers back in the envelope and gave it back to me. Okay. How do you see this playing out? At the trial. Right before the end. I want him to think he's gotten away with it. Ebenezer snorted. You're going to make Ancient Mai and about 500 former associates of La Fortier very angry. Yeah, I hardly slept last night. I was so worried about him. He snorted. I've got a theory about something. Oh? I told him. Ebenezer's face darkened, sentence by sentence. He turned his hands palm up and looked down at them. They were broad, strong, seamed, and calloused with work. And they were steady. They were scabs on one palm. Where he had fallen to the ground during last night's melee, ink stained some of his fingertips. I'll need to take some steps, he said. You'd best get a move on. I nodded. See you there. He took his spectacles off and began to polish the lenses carefully with a handkerchief. I. The trial began less than an hour later. I sat on a stone bench that was set over to one side of the stage floor, Molly at my side. We were to be witnesses. Mouse sat on the floor beside me. He was going to be a witness, too, though I was the only one who knew it. The seats were all filled. That was why the council met at various locations out in the real world, rather than Edinburgh all the time. There simply wasn't enough room. Wardens formed a perimeter all the way around the stage, at the doors, and in the aisles that came down between the rows of benches. Everyone present was wearing his or her formal robes, all flowing black with stoles and of silk and satin in one of the various colors and patterns of trim that denoted status among the council's members. Blue stoles for members, red for those with a century of service, and braided silver cord for acknowledged master alchemists, a gold-stitched cadis for master healers, a copper chevron near the collar for those with a doctorate in a scholarly discipline. Some of the wizards had so many of them that they had stretched the fabric of the stole. An embroidered white seal of Solomon for master exorcists, and so on. I had a plain blue stole with no ornaments whatsoever, though I'd been toying with the idea of embroidering GED on it in red, white, and blue thread. Molly was the only one in the room wearing a brown robe. People were avoiding our gazes. The White Council loved its ceremonies. Anastasia Lucio appeared in the doorway in her full regalia, plus the gray cloak of the wardens. Her arm was still in a sling, but she carried the ceremonial staff of office of the captain of the wardens in one hand. She entered the room, and the murmuring buzz of the crowd fell silent. She slammed the end of the staff three times upon the floor, and the six members of the senior council entered in the dark robes and purple stoles, led by the Merlin. They proceeded to the center rear of the stage and stood solemnly. Peabody appeared, carrying a lap-sized writing desk, and sat down on the far end of the bench from Molly and me to begin taking notes, his pen scratching. 
I put my hand on Mouse's head and waited for the show to begin. Because this was all this was. A show. Two more wardens appeared with a bound figure between them. Morgan was brought in and stood as all accused brought before the council did. With his hands bound in front of him and a black hood over his head. He wasn't in any shape to be walking, the idiot. But he was managing to limp heavily along without being physically supported by either warden. He must have been on a load of painkillers to manage it. The Merlin, speaking in Latin, said, We have convened today on a matter of justice to try one, Donald Morgan, who stands accused of the premeditated murder of senior council member Oleron Lafortier, conspiracy with the enemies of the White Council and treason against the White Council. We will begin with a review of the evidence. They stacked things up against Morgan for a while, laying out all the damning evidence. They had a lot of it. Morgan standing there with the murder weapon in his hand over the still warm corpse. The bank account was slightly less than six million dollars suddenly appearing in it. The fact that he had escaped detention and badly wounded three wardens in the process. The subsequently committed sedition of misleading other wizards. Molly and I were just barely mentioned by name into helping him hide from the wardens. Donald Morgan, the Merlin said, have you anything to say in your defense? That part was sort of unusual. The accused were very rarely given much of a chance to say anything. It clouded issues, so. I do not contest the charges. Morgan said firmly through his black hood, I, and I alone, am responsible for La Fortier's death. The Merlin looked like he'd just found out that someone had cooked up his own puppy in the sausage at breakfast that morning. He nodded once. If there is no other evidence, then the senior counsel will now pass. I stood up. The Merlin broke off and blinked at me. The room fell into a dead silence, except for the scratch of Peabody's pen. He paused to turn to a new page and pulled a second inkwell out of his pocket, placing it in the writing desk. Anastasia stared at me with her lips pressed together, her eyes questioning. What the hell was I doing? I winked at her, then walked out into the center of the stage and turned to face the senior counsel. Warden Dresden, Ebenezer said, have you some new evidence to present for the senior counsel's consideration? I do, I said. Point of order, Ancient Mai injected smoothly. Warden Dresden was not present at the murder or when the accused escaped custody. He can offer no direct testimony as the truth or falsehood of those events. Another point of order, listens to Wind said. Warden Dresden earns a living as a private investigator, and his propensity for fettering out the truth in difficult circumstances is well established. Mai looked daggers at Injun Joe. Warden Dresden, the Merlin said heavily, your history of conflict with Warden Morgan acting in his role as a warden of the White Council is well known. You should be advised that any damning testimony you give will be leavened with the knowledge of your history of extreme, sometimes violent animosity. The Merlin wasn't the Merlin for nothing. He had instincts enough to sense that maybe the game wasn't over yet. After all, and he knew how to play the crowd. He wasn't warning me, so much as making sure that the wizards present knew how I, much I didn't like Morgan, so that my support would be that much more convincing. I understand, I said. Merlin nodded. Proceed. I beamed at him. I feel just like Hercule Perot, I said and my reasonably functional Latin. Let me enjoy this for a second. I took a deep breath and exhaled in satisfaction. The Merlin had masterful self-control. His expression never changed, but his left eye twitched in a nervous tick. Score one for the cartoon coyote. I first became suspicious that Morgan was being framed. Well, basically, when I heard the ridiculous charge against him, I said, I don't know if you know this man, but I do. 
He's hounded me for most of my life. If I'd been accused of lopping off the heads of baby bunny rabbits because someone accused them of being warlocks, I could buy that. But this man could no more betray the White Council than he could flap his arms and fly. Working from that point, I hypothesized that another person within the Council had killed Lafortier and set Morgan up to take the blame. So I began an independent investigation. I gave the senior council and the watching crowd of wizards a rundown of the past few days, leaving out the overly sensitive and unimportant bits. My investigation cumulated in the theory that the guilty individual was not only trying to fix the blame upon Morgan, but planting the seeds of a renewed outbreak of hostilities with a vampire white court by implicating them in the death. In an effort to manipulate this person into betraying himself, I continued, I let it be known that a conspirator had come forward to confess their part in the scheme, and would address members of the White Council at a certain place and time in Chicago, working on the theory that the true killer was a member of the Council. Indeed, someone here at headquarters at Edinburgh. I hypothesized that he would have little choice but to come to Chicago through the way from Edinburgh, and I had the exit of the way placed under surveillance. I held up a manila envelope. These are the photographs taken at the scene, and everyone who came through the way during the next several hours. I opened the envelope and began passing the senior council the photos. They took them, looking at each in turn. Ebenezer calmly confirmed that the images of the wardens exiting the way together with himself, Mai, and Listens to Wind were accurate. Other than this group, I said, I believe it is highly unlikely that anyone from Edinburgh should have randomly arrived at the way in Chicago. Given that the group was indeed assaulted by creatures with the support of a wizard of council-level skill at the meeting, I believe it is reasonable to state that the killer took the bait. I turned, drawing out the last photo with a dramatic flourish worthy of Perot and held it up so that the crowd could see it while I said, So why don't you tell us what you were doing in the Chicago area last night, Wizard Peabody? If I'd had a keyboard player lurking nearby for so proper organ string, it would have been perfect. Everyone on the senior council except Ebenezer, and for some reason the gatekeeper, turned to stare, slack-jawed at Peabody. The senior council's secretary sat perfectly still beneath his little lap desk. Then he said, I take it that you have proof more convincing than a simple visual image? Such things are easily manufactured. In fact, I said, I do. I had a witness who was close enough to smell you. On cue, Mouse stood up and turned toward Peabody. His low growl filled the room like a big, gentle drum roll. That's all you have, Peabody asked, a photo and a dog. Mai looked as if someone had hit her between the eyes with a sledgehammer. That, she said in a breathless tone, is a foo dog. She stared at me. Where did you get such a thing? And why were you allowed to keep it? He sort of picked me, I said. The Merlin's eyes had brightened. My the beast's identification is reliable? She stared at me with an obvious confusion. Entirely. There are several other wizards who could testify to the fact. Yes, rumbled a stocky, bald man with an ancient cast to his features. It's true, said a middle-aged woman with skin several tones darker than my own, maybe from India or Pakistan. Interesting, the Merlin said, turning toward Peabody. There was something almost shark-like about his sudden focus. Working on the evidence Dresden found, Ebenezer said, Warden Ramirez and I searched Peabody's chambers thoroughly not twenty minutes ago. A test of the inks he used to attain the signatures of the senior council for various authorizations revealed the presence of a number of chemical and alchemical substances that are known to have been used to assist psychic manipulation of their subjects. 
It is my belief that Peabody has been drugging the ink for the purpose of attempting greater mental influence over the decisions of members of the senior council, and that it is entirely possible that he has compromised the th free will of younger members of the council outright. Listens to when mouth opened in sudden surprise and understanding. He looked down at his ink-stained fingertips and then up at Peabody. Peabody may not have seen the man turn into a grizzly, but he was bright enough to know that Injun Joe was getting set to adjust another relative ass-to-ears ratio. The little secretary took one look around the room and then at my dog. The expression went out of his face. The end, he said calmly and clearly, is nigh. And then he flung his spare pot of ink onto the floor, shattering the glass. Mouse let out a wolfing bark of warning and knocked Molly backward off the bench as a dark cloud rose up away from the smashed bottle, swelling with supernatural speed. One of them caught a warden who had leapt forward toward Peabody. It encircled his chest and then closed. Everything the slender thread of mist touched turned instantly to a fine black ash, slicing through him as efficiently as an electric knife through deli meat. The two pieces of the former warden fell to the floor with wet, heavy thumps. I'd seen almost exactly the thing happen once, years before. Get back! I scream. It's Mordite! Then the lights went out and the room exploded into screams and chaos. Yikes. So this video is going to be kind of fun to edit. Um, I don't know if you'll notice the background is going to change like four times. My phone kept on overheating for some reason and I had to keep on um, redoing parts and resetting things up and then I would play the video and the video would at, oh, oh, ah, skip around and so I'm hoping that this goes around pretty good we shall see I want to thank you guys so much for joining me today and you have a wonderful wonderful and blessed day